The Lord be with you, everyone. And I want to share what I believe will be a scripture of healing us at our very core, make us whole. It's in 1 Peter in chapter 5 and verse 6. Let's read it. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And especially the last part, and it's a verse that is, I believe, well known to many people, casting all your anxiety on him. Some of your older translations have casting all your care upon him because, because, there's a reason for that, because he cares for you. I, I want to look at this um, in, in, sort of head on and in, in such some people might be a little upset to begin with, uh, but you're looking here at two worlds that come together confront each other in this verse. Um, this is what it means to be in the world, but not of it. The, the whole world system and the way it believes and the way it looks at life. And on the other hand, we who are in Christ, we're in that world, but we're not of it. For our life now is anchored in Jesus, and we see all of life through him and in him. Uh, and, and that's what we have here. And I'll put it this way. We have seen, well, it depends which denomination you might have belonged to, which part of the Christian world you might have been in, but the, in general, the the world is looked upon as an exterior behavior. Do you know what I mean? Um, if you go uh, among most Christians and you talk about the world, they immediately think in terms of eating or drinking or the clothes they wear or don't wear, um, places that they might go but don't go. You understand, it's exterior. But when we come to the scripture, it's not exterior at all. In fact, it is very interior. The world system is an interior way of looking at life. It results in exterior behavior. But we have to first and foremost realize how interior this is. We're dealing with something very deep within us. And what that interior believing and seeing results in may be not the same as what many churches believe the world is. What are, what are we talking about? Well, number one, you notice the preface to what we're talking about tonight is humility. You caught that. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you. There's a lot I might say about that, but enough for, for tonight. Um, the, the, the pride, which is the opposite of humility, began in the Garden of Eden. Please slow down your mind and hear what I'm saying. That right there in the Garden of Eden, something was birthed that had not been in the human race before. And that was pride, because Satan's lie brought with it that giddy sense of pride. He said that they, that is the human race that stood before him in Adam and Eve, the human race, you shall be as God. I mean, how exalted, how dizzy can you be? And of course, it, it, it found a, a resonance because humankind are so incredible, made to be the image of God and to have a body and mind and imagination that is capable of imaging God in union with him. And, and so there is a sense in which 
us humans, we have to come to the point where we choose to be human <laughs> because, of course, we are. But we are so like God in so many ways that we have to choose to remind ourselves that we are creatures and all that we have is derived from Him, our God love creator. Um, but the, the lie was, you shall be as God, you shall be independent of God, and you in your own right and in your own person shall be as God. And I know what, what many things that means, but uh, it, it means at the heart then, I'm in control of all things. I, I am not the steward of creation under God, but I'm the master. I'm responsible for everything. And it isn't but a, a, a blink before we're saying responsible for everything and every person in my life. I'm in control. Everything is on my shoulders. Huh. Well, you've only got to have a split second of believing that's true and taking a look around your life, and that produces fear. Fear in all its faces, but the one that it produces, number one, is anxiety. And you could say it's uh, worry, worry and anxiety, uh, the, the chaos, the confusion that is now raging inside of me. I'm in control and I feel terrified. It was a wonderful idea when it was presented and it made me feel I, I'm, I'm the greatest thing in the universe, but now I'm in control and I don't know what to do. I'm responsible for everything and everyone and I don't know how to answer that. It's a burden on my back and it's crushing me into the ground. You remember I've said this many times, but definitely in this context, um, the very first words that are recorded in the Bible that the human race spoke, which was after this happened, after human was injected with this lie that they were to be as God, the first words spoken after that, Adam said, actually said it to uh, God, and he, he said, I was afraid. And, and his fear caused him to act in that rather strange panic mode uh, of covering himself with fig leaves, and then going to hide behind the bushes lest God should see him. I was afraid. I was afraid. Okay. Let's just put that on hold for a minute. How do we function? How do you happen? How does behaviors come into place? Um, what's the mechanics of being human? Well, let me give it to you very quickly. Um, it begins in your imagination. I, I don't know if you realize that, but you, you are receiving pictures and images um, flashing um, through your imagination, and that produces thoughts. You think about the pictures, and then that feeds the thoughts, and so there's this dance going on between the seeing and the thinking. But the thinking plus imagination produces deep feelings, emotion, and, and emotion is a tremendous energy within us. In fact, that is, if you break up the word, E, motion. E being energy, energy in motion. And, and that comes as we think about what we see in our imagination. And that energy that emotion produces goes through our entire body. I might say that all of this that I am now speaking of takes place, I, I, I would say, at the speed of light. Um, I mean, we, have you noticed, you can have um, a picture in your imagination which translates into a thought and an emotion, and it becomes an energy that can actually cause your body to tremble 
it, it, it goes through the very deepest part, through the cells of your body, and it creates a certain condition in your physical, in your matter, so that you can have a thought that immediately gives you an upset stomach. Have you noticed that? Um, it, it's... <laughs> See, your, your, your body is not just an independent blob of stuff. It, it, it's energy that is now materialized. We, we can see it. it. It changes the shape of our face. That, that imagination can cause your face to change immediately. It's, it's amazing how that energy goes through your body. And I say at the speed of light, I've never checked it, but um, it, it is so fast that you might say it's immediate. Well, what, what is happening here? That a new thought has been presented into the human race, more than a thought. It, it is a, a coming with all the terrible energy of darkness. You shall be as God. And it plants itself in the imagination, which produces thoughts of self as God and self as responsible, and self as the beginning and end and so on. And, and that produces emotion, but... As I said, by this time, the sudden realization and the facing of life in that position, that it's a lie, of course, but that's what man believes. And it produces the physical behavior of panic and dismay and terror, panic that hides in the trees, anxiety. Hold that equation of how we function in your mind and go back to this anxiety that was produced directly by the lie that says we are in control and responsible for life. That God is, well, he's there, of course, but he's over there. I'm my own person. I'm my own, I'm separated from him to get on with doing my awful responsibility of being God. So what is anxiety? Let, let's face it. Um, well, and you see, this is where I say some might be upset, but just hold, hold it. Don't, don't turn me off. Um, just stay with me. But, but anxiety, I, I'm sorry, we can't come to the anxious and the fearful and put a hand on their shoulder and say, there, there, cheer up, it's going to be all right. No, if we're going to deal with anxiety, we have to come to see what is happening to produce it. And so the first thing I would say about anxiety is it's a way of seeing. It's a way of seeing. It's, it's, it's a belief system. I believe something. And because I believe that something, I see life in the way of that belief. And of course, as I've said, that belief is that I am responsible and God is marginalized in this. I'm responsible. I'm in control, as I say, of everything and everybody in my life. And sometimes people believe of everything in the world. Um, but, but it's a way of believing. You believe that. And, and you believe it as not an option. It, it's because as far as you're concerned at this moment, there is no other way. And therefore, when you look out at life, that's how you see it. You see it. But then that turns around and you judge. You, you become the judge of every situation. That, that, you remember that it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the words good and evil there are not primarily or necessarily moral good and evil. It means something good, something pleasant, something nice, something that will warm my soul on the one hand, or evil, which means something that pains me, hurts me, upsets me. So, so I look at life now and I judge it and I, and I say, this, this, is, this is bad. This is, this, this is not a good thing. Um, I, th this brings pain and this brings hurt and, and I don't want it and I reject it and, and, and I push it away from me. 
and and but I can't of course and therefore my imagination takes over as what is going to happen now because this thing is in our life and I don't know what to do with it and I'm responsible to move it and I can't move it so then we turn to judging ourselves in the present situation. And we judge ourselves and say, some God you are. You're supposed to be in charge. You're supposed to be in control. You're supposed to handle this. You know, you're, you're not. You're, you, the thing is bigger than you. You're no good. You're stupid. And so it goes on. We judge the people in it and blame them as we're trying to pretend the thing isn't here, but our imagination knows it is here and tries to create a future that is full of despair, dismay, destruction and doom. I, I suppose you could say it is seeing oneself. It's a belief that causes me to see oneself as abandoned. I'm on my own here. It's a terrible feeling that I am abandoned. You remember, God has been marginalized. We see ourselves as alone and separated from God. He's there, I suppose, if we throw up an SOS, boat is sinking, come and save us. But he, he's over there. And we see ourselves as victims of this something that has happened in our life. We see its, its terrible power. Now, when I say see, I'm referring again to your imagination. You know your imagination. It's, it's like the room in the house of your soul uh, where, where you see those late night movies, you know, and, and you lay in bed and it goes over and over. The things got stuck and it goes around and around like a misery go round, continually bringing up images, but what is going to happen because you can't handle this, because you can't control it, you can't make it go away. And then we go back and we lash ourselves, if only I had done this, if only I had done that, what if I had done that? Hmm. Of course, that's all seeing into the future, this doom that is going to happen because of this. And that's all fantasy, and I mean the word very clearly, absolute idiotic fantasy, because it's not here. And, and you are creating a future in your mind. Incidentally, and this is just alongside, um, but it, do you remember my equation? Your imagination produces the thoughts and, uh, and then it comes out in, in a terrible energy uh, of emotion, which that energy then produces your, your body. A and the, do you realize all that imagination, please, th this is scientific fact, all your imagination of what could happen, might happen, will probably happen, and, and I'll, I'll get sick over this, and I'll probably die over this, and the whole thing, all that. Do you realize that your body, the organs of your body, believe and record that as having actually happened? And so your body is now in a trauma as if you had been in the doom that you have imagined anxiety anxiety you see it releases into our body chemicals did you know that your anxious negative thoughts produce into your body chemicals chemicals that are going to kill you if you let it carry on for the rest of your life they're, they're poisonous but they are addictive did you know that Oh, we, we, we say, you know, the drug addict and the alcoholic and they're addicted. Well, anxiety is addicted because the, the, those chemicals, they give us a rush. Do you know what I mean? There, there's something, it's very hard to put into words because it doesn't make sense. Um, but as those chemicals are released into the body, the, the body gets a certain rush, satisfaction, I don't know what to call it, 
uh, any more than I can explain why a, a drug addict will, will, will continually drug themselves to death because of the feeling they get. Well, anxiety brings its feeling. Do you know there are, there are many people, many people who get a, a rush of something that satisfies them at a deepest level in an anxiety meltdown. Why is it that some people seek out the negative in the media? They, they meet you in the morning to present all the terrible things that they have been meditating on all night that they heard on the 10 o'clock news. Why? Why would anybody do that? Because not only all the the terrible things that happened as you watched it and had this sense of responsibility and I should be doing something and, and something's going to happen and I can't stop it. Well, what, what happened to you then? But now you're repeating it and it's starting all over again and you're trying to share your poison with other people. Why, why is it that people, and this is uh, very, very uh, prevalent, the, the, they want gossip uh, and they, they, they cluster together to share the latest gossip. Of course, if, if, if you're in church, we call it a prayer request. But uh, I mean, normal people would call it gossip where, where you're going to turn over the problems of other people and, and, and enter into all the negativity and all the tragedy and trauma and feel good about it. You must or you would never go back again, but meet the same people to share the same thing. Huh. It's, a, it's addictive, you see, it's addictive. You try and stop it, huh, you'll soon find out. But I suppose the greatest lie of anxiety is that it masquerades as being godly. I, I, I mean, the devil said that was his word, you shall be as gods. He didn't say you'll be like me. He said you'll should be, you shall be as gods. And, and so to feel this, this pride that says I'm in control and I've got to fix it and I'm the one that everyone must come to, it, it masquerades, I say again, as being godly. It's... Uh, it's the feeling that we're truly caring. We're truly solving the situation by all our worrying about it. And the person who doesn't worry, the person who has found the secret of this verse and no longer has any care, that person is considered by many as being callous. They don't worry. They don't, they don't get anxious. They're uncaring. So therefore they must be without love or compassion or irresponsible. I had an aunt once, many, 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 many decades ago, and she, she really believed that. And so when something went wrong or awry, her response would be, well, I can't do anything, but I will worry for you. Hmm. What good did that do? You see, we have been taught. Come on, let's get real with each other. We have been taught by our ancestors. And of course, that becomes very immediate. Your parents were taught by the ancestors. And so it comes on down the line. You were taught to see yourself as, I don't know what you call it, a strip plugs, you know, that thing where you plug in a lot of plugs, um, a surge protector, some call it. Um, I, you know what I mean. You, you've got one plug, you stick this in, and then you can put in how many other um, plugs to draw the electricity. Do you realize some, sometimes when I have been seeking to help people in this, and I, just they, as they begin to talk, I see them as the, this long uh, series of plugs and everybody's sticking their plugs in to draw their strength out of them. See, because as, as surely as a person believes that they are 
to control everything, you'll get others who believe that they control everything by taking your strength. Oh yes, everyone must be looked after. You've got a problem, plug into me. I'm sure I've got an empty plug here, you know. Everybody must be cared for by you. It's your responsibility. You know, you know the people, pastors won't like me now, but you know, we need someone to look after the children's uh, church or the nursery. And, and, no, no, and, and then you put up your hand, I'll do it. And, and, but of course you're doing everything else, aren't you? But, and your feeling is, well, if I don't, who wills? It's my responsibility. You, the, the, the person who is always there, always ready to take the next plug and, and get some more strength sucked out of them because they feel, I'm responsible for this. I've got to control this. And if there is ever any time for you, which I doubt you've arranged for that, but if, if there is time for you, you take it with feelings of terrible guilt you feel selfish, mm, that's it, selfish. If I am not living according to Satan's lie, I feel selfish. I feel I don't deserve this. It's not godly, it's not loving. Well, let me tell you this. No, it's <laughs> when you are giving yourself you're destroying yourself with an anxiety because of trying to control or imagine you can or imagine you should. That is not godly. That is not loving. Rather, it's abuse to you. You're being abused. You're abusing yourself. You're demeaning yourself. You're dismissing the worth God has given you and calling yourself a slave to the human race. So that means you're totally out of step with how God created you to live. And of course, how are you doing? How are your children being helped by all your worrying? Not at all. In fact, you are sending to them an energy that is going to produce the very thing you're worrying about. I mean, what positive things, what positive changes, beautiful things have come as a result of your anxiety. You couldn't name one. The very word anxiety means, check a dictionary, the word anxiety means to tear apart, shred, mm -hmm, right. And, and its sister word worry, worry means to strangle and to choke. In fact, there's a, there's a word in the Bible, distress, and the, and the word distress is, is very, that's a third sister to the, the, these words. And that means in the original Hebrew to, to walk into a canyon where the walls are getting closer and closer until there's no room to move. You can't turn around, you can't go on, you are crushed. Oh, that sounds right. Hemmed in. So, anxiety, it, it works within this belief system that, that governs my imagination and the thoughts and the emotions. Uh, and it says I'm alone. Uh, I'm, at least for the minute, uh, I have no thought of God in this. Um, no thought of God. Uh, I, I, I was a great Christian in church on Sunday morning, but I've forgotten that. And, and I'm now acting as if God is not part of my life. And, and he's far away, and I've got to wake him up to come and help me. All circumstances conspire to destroy me. It's a dark, negative belief and thinking process. It comes down to probably three words. I look at myself and I say, I am not. I am not. I'm not enough to handle today. I'm not enough to deal with all that I've got to deal with today. I don't have enough wisdom. I don't have enough strength. I don't have the ability. I don't have the authority in life. 
I don't have what it takes to be successful. I don't have what it takes to handle life. I cannot. I have not. I am not. And it covers all areas of life. The challenges, the opportunities, the pressures. I mean, you can get anxious over the most beautiful things, that you're going on a picnic, but by the time you get there, everybody's in chaos because of your anxiety that has got to happen right. Yeah. It operates in a non-existent future as you imagine the situation unfolding without God. That's destruction and chaos. The body experiences and records it as actually happening and is making you sick. You go to the doctor and then he gives you pills that only make you sicker in other areas. And you're all, it's really anxiety. And of course, religious anxiety. I'm supposed to go and be with my brothers and sisters and receive strength, but what happens? It, it, it's religious anxiety. I come away feeling even more guilty and more ashamed and condemned. And, and I, I feel God is, is, is mad at me. And so in the middle of all this chaos, I try and get saved again. And it's a terror of God and the future. It ends up that apart from everything else, what should have been a source of comfort has produced, I, I'm self-loathing, I'm no good. I'm unworthy. Boy, hell, we say that, don't we? I'm not good enough. Here we are. I am not. That's the world. Do you understand me? I've been in so many churches. I mean, I've been preaching 65 years. I've been in just about every church you can think of. And I don't know how many pastors are, are so proud that we don't let the world in here, you know. We don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't do this, we don't do that. And yeah, and you, you've got a church full of anxious, gossiping people. That's the world. The anxiety. That's what came out of the Garden of Eden, number one. The words were hardly out of the mouth of Satan before they were filled with fear and anxiety. That's the first, that's the prime example of the world system. That's the world that Jesus says you're in, but you're not of it. Yes, we're in it. You're surrounded by it, by your family in many cases. You're surrounded in your office, your factory. You're surrounded in your teenage and 20s in, in college and surrounded. It's, it's a world of anxiety and fear and panic. It's a world of pills to try and calm my craziness down. Jesus says you're in it, but you're not of it. You're not of it. You walk in the midst of that world, yes, without anxiety, without care. Do you, do you realize your imagination, your thoughts, your, your emotions, the, the energy that causes your body to be like it is, you are not wired for anxiety. It result, anxiety produces disease and sickness and brokenness of mind, emotions. If you've got anything that looks like a doctor, when you're sick, he will ask you, are you anxious? Because he knows that anxiety produces disease, which tells me my body is not wired for anxiety. If my body was wired for anxiety, then get anxious and you'll feel good. I mean, in the sense of true health, but no. You feel good in that twisted something inside of you, but it produces disease and sickness and death. M many death certificates should be they died of anxiety. That's the truth. And I say it again, I just said it, but let me say it. The church, and I say that in the broadest swath of the brush, the church has accepted our difference as being exterior. The world will look at us and see, we don't do this, we don't go there, we don't say this, we don't wear that. And they call that holiness. But we're exactly the same as the world in terms of anxiety and broken relationships. 
No, the, the church, whatever that means in the context I'm now speaking, has accepted exterior difference as holiness, but allowed anxiety to be part of normal life. Jesus was speaking to believers when he said the sower went forth to sow. And he describes the, the seed. I mean, this is the seed of the word of God and it comes in. And he describes the seed falling into our heart. He says, who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. What did I just say? Choke! the word, strangle the word, so it becomes unfruitful. That word, uh, worry of the world, it's translated some places as life's cares, anxiety, of course, busy distractions, a divided or torn apart hurt, heart, choke, strangle. Oh, anxiety takes time. It fills our imagination and thoughts and feelings for hours, takes sleep from your eyes, depletes your energy, brings all creativity to a stop. It's the world system. It's the lie subtly controlling the flow of thoughts to behavior and producing behavior we were never intended to have and produces diseases of the mind and emotions we were never intended to have. But there's more here than that. The new creation is right up against the old. And if, if care, anxiety is, is the pulse beat of the old and the flesh, then the pulse beat of the new creation in Jesus is, He cares for you. And, and the meaning there could emphasize tender care. Care. He cares for you. In the middle of this negative darkness, He cares for you. What is care? Care is a special application of love toward a person of great value. That is, you, you bestow a great worth upon them. They are so important to you. That the word used is care. It's care takes pleasure in the beloved, in the loved one. In fact, it's of the same family of words as that word in the Old Testament, pleasure. Where, where do you remember Caleb reported it maybe best? He says, "He, God is pleased with us. And the word means he delights in us. In fact, the, the original meaning of the word is to bend. That is, he has a bias, a bent toward us. He, he, he wants to special us, to bless us, to show us extreme kindness. It, it, it means to go over the top in kindness to watch over you. Uh, and I would even use the word fuss over, although that could have negative connotations to some people, but, but to lovingly fuss so that the interest of the one loved becomes the interest of the caregiver. He cares for you, therefore he cares about what you're interested in. He cares about the details of your life. What affects you affects him. Have you ever thought of that? That, that he's, he's blessedly, gloriously tangled up with all of your life, so there's nothing that happens. Of course, another word that came in during the Dark Ages uh, is that there's things spiritual and there's things secular. Do you know the word secular means the place where God is not? No, there's no such thing as secular to believers. He, he's, he's tangled up in all of our life. He's in the kitchen. He's in uh, the, every part of the factory. He's right there with you in the office and in the school. And 
He's in the flow of energy of you. That is, he's in your imagination to, to care for you there where everything begins. He's there in your thoughts. He's there in your emotions. And then, of course, in your behavior. You're tangled up with him. Care. It, it means he is fascinated with you. Uh, he desires to know you personally from the heart. He, he cares for us by name. He calls you by name. Huh. It's no wonder in, in the Psalms, number 8, what is it, verse 3, where he says, the psalmist said, I, I consider the heavens or outer space, and I look at the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And then he says, what is man? When I look out there and I feel such a speck, what is man? That you take thought of him. You think about me. You care for me. Well, who on earth am I that you, God, creator, would think and be involved in my life? Who am I, said the psalmist, the son of man, that you care for him? There's the word, you see. In, in the message paraphrase, he says, then I, he said, I look at all the stars. Then, then I look at my micro self and I wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? But that's the point, you see. That's what the psalmist said. He does. Can, can you understand that? Or what about Hebrews 13, verse 5, let your character, well, he talks about our involvement with, with money, but he goes on and says, no, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we can confidently say, that is, to life around us, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? Now, the Amplified really um, puts it very deeply there. He says, for he, God himself, has said. Now, listen, this is the original Greek uh, language here. So it's a bit awkward to say, but this is what it says in the original Greek. It says, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, or let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Okay, we, we can then be very encouraged to realize there is not a detail of life, but that he is with us and deeply with us, involved with us. Isaiah 49 Zion or the bunch of believers said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. I'm on my own here. And the Lord's response, can a woman forget her nursing child? Have no compassion on the son of her womb? Hmm, even these may forget. But I will not forget you. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. That is, God ha has, well, it's a covenant expression where, where the blood was shed by a scar in the hand. He says, I'll never forget you. You, your name, your address, your workplace, everything that's happening right now in your living room. He's involved. He cares for you. But of course, it's not an exterior. That, that is, we've got to get away from this exterior thing so, so that, you know, we, we want God to fix it. That is, make people go away, make them stop talking, make this happen. I want a sunny day tomorrow, you know. No, that, that would make God into a genie, wouldn't it? Rub the bottle and out comes the genie and got five wishes. No, let, let's backtrack. All of this starts within you. 
as we've been saying, our body then is the dwelling, it's the sacred shine, it's the mansion of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in the rooms of our imagination, our thought, our emotion, all that energy that is now in the cells of your body making you who you are. He, he is, is right there. He's in you. That's, that's the truth. It's a deep level that the Holy Spirit is our friend. <sighs> Talk about with. He, he's, he's so with. He, he's closer than our heartbeat. He's closer than our breath. He's our advisor, our counselor, our teacher, our guide in life, and always with love that is gentle and kind, tender, compassionate. When we know and believe in our core the love that God has for us in giving to us and into us, Jesus, Son of God, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, His very presence inside of us. You know that. You rest into it and you are healed in your deepest self, in, in the hidden recesses of your person. He is and He reveals that caring love he unties the knots that that lie has tied. He untangles our fears and our anxieties. He even gets into the organs of our body where the lie is making them sick. And he gives us true healing, exposes the lie and expels that lie. He's the spirit of truth and the truth shall set you free. Oh, that, that's, that's the truth. That's the absolute. You see, you are wired. You're made in the image of God. And the image of God means that all that God is must be imaged in you through Jesus Christ. That's, that's the basic blueprint of your creation. You're wired to be loved. You, you are built in all the magnificence of the cells of your body and the way that your imagination and your uh, thoughts, and the energy of your being, it, it's all wired and built for love. Look, read the entire Bible. You find that's true. You are wired to receive. You're a derived creature. That's the lie. You're not independent. You're not you're one that receives. And what do you receive? Not power. You receive His love, the greatest power in the universe. You receive love's abilities. You receive. You're always receiving. And that receiving throws light upon you and you see yourself as the beloved of God. And you see His goodness and you see His love. For what you believe always controls what you see. And so you accepted that I'm cared for. I am cared for. And I'm not being selfish when I say it. And I'm not being proud when I say it. That's the end of pride when you realize I'm the receiver. I'm the one cared for. And to see that I'm loved, cared for, mobilizes out of all that, what, what the, the fear, the fright, the fight, the freeze, the paralysis that anxiety brings. The love of God. In fact, he says in 1 John 4, the, the perfect love casts out all fear. It's a very strong word. It would be used of a bouncer in a club where he throws the offender down the steps. Well, the, the love of God, it says in 1 John 4, he throws fear out from us. We walk fully alive in His hands. It's, it's the way it is. Make time to be aware of His love in every day. Remember, anxiety will control you for days and kill you in the end and certainly make you walking dead in between times. You can take time. If you don't take time, well, I won't go there. But we, we make time to be aware that I'm cared for. I, I didn't say have a quiet time. I didn't say pray a prayer list. I, I, I said, 
Know that you're cared for. Just be in the presence of love. Aware of the presence of God who is 1,000% for you and with you. He's the oxygen that goes right inside of you into your genes and cells, into your DNA. Yes, I mean that. He is the life of our body and he's the life of our soul. Just because he loves us. And that love is the greatest healing, saving energy. Our peace is a response to his care for us. I've told you before, stand in, in the sunlight. As that sun shines through a crack in the, the window um, curtains, and there it is, sir, you, right across the room, you go and stand in that sunlight and just feel its warmth. Well, there's more than a beam of light. There is the love of God poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. Stand in that love. Be loved. I've given that as a prescription to people in the past. I've told them on the hour, every hour, set your watch to wake you up. On the hour, every hour, just to, to if you have to go to the bathroom to do it, go there, lock the door and just be. And say, I'm the beloved of God. I'm not in control of life. I'm not responsible for all of life. I rest in Him who is. He who is my wisdom. He who is my strength. He is my ability. Jump in the river of life and swim and let the waters of life pour through your whole being. See, humility is not making yourself a doormat. That's, that's Satan's pride. Look at me, I'm a doormat. No, the humility in Scripture means that, that you realize who you are. I'm a creature, but I'm a glorious creature, beloved of God, bestowed with worth. And I receive his life. That's who I is. That's who I am. That's humility. To know at your core that you're not God but that you, an exalted creature, rest in him and depend upon him. Well, how do you make that happen? Boy, I need another hour, don't I? It says, casting all your care upon him. Casting is not an act of willpower. It's not a formula that, that you now found a new way of not being anxious. It's a faith response. That is, do you believe what I just said about God's love for you? I mean, believe it, rest in it. Well, then respond. In the light of his care for you, knowing his care, because of his care, we cast all our cares and anxieties upon him. The word cast, it, it, it's a word um, once for all. It, so, Primarily, we're not looking at every little anxiety we cast it, but it, it's coming to a point, and I trust it's right now, where, where you see what anxiety really is, and you see anxiety for what it is, and you see that it's not a godly thing, it, it's, it, it's that of the world, it originated in Satan's lie, so you, you, you've had it. That's, that's the idea behind this word. You've had it. You're done with it. And you cast it. You're done. You cast your anxieties upon him. And you can because he, ah, he's already taken your grief and your sorrow, your anxieties, and crucified it at the cross. Now, whenever it comes, you feel the rat of anxiety gnawing in the cellar of your soul. Well, you don't uh, start all over again. You just say, stop that because on this day, in this year, at this time, I cast my anxiety upon the Lord. And, and it's his responsibility, kill the rat, by recognizing it's already dead. Cast it. it may, may, you're, you're not uh, selective, saying, well, I'll, I'll cast this on the Lord, but my children, they're my responsibility. No, you cast your kids there too. Yeah, yeah. 
stop all of that. You're worrying them to death. Uh, and you, you, it, it's not a selective. It's taking this system of belief and throwing it upon him cast the world is very, the word is very strong it means to throw um but i yeah throw is okay cast i'm not so sure about that yeah, this is personal because when i say cast I, I think of a day fishing and you cast your line and that can be very very peaceful no this word is not peaceful so throw is a much better word uh, actually hurl you know that word? I hurl it. It's something I throw in a baseball. Um, it, it, it'd be toss in when you, you take a piece of paper or a piece of garbage and you toss it into the garbage can. It, 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 there's no, nothing nice about this. You're, you're, it's an emotionally charged action. You could say there's holy anger here. You're saying, I'm done with this. You, you, you never negotiate with Satan's lies. Never, never. You're done with it. It's the same thing, remember in the epistles where it says, put off bitterness and gossip and rumor and slander. And the word put off there is the same. It's a very strong, angry word, as if you're taking filthy clothes off that, that are crawling with lice and you take them, fling it from you. That's the meaning of the word. And it, it, it Come, comes here with cast. You, you see, you, you cast it from you. You throw away the rotted thing called anxiety. It's a life-defining act. It's bold, courageous. You step into being who you are in Christ. Do it, you see. Even if right now you're in the middle of a meltdown, there'll never be a better time to do that. Uh, and of course, if you throw something, it was in your hand. Now it's not. It's in somebody else's hand. It's landed on another. And so casting is the great transfer. It's the great exchange from me to him. Because you love me, I'm putting this into your hands. And some of you who are addicted need to do this on the hour, every hour, to take your children and say, I put them in the hand of God. Here I put Mary in the hand of God. Uh, I, I put the IRS into the hands of, you know, I, I mean it. I mean it. We need to do this repetition so we can get into our subconscious and change our habits, which are addictive habits. It's the great exchange. I put it in his hands. But I said, exchange. Exchange, yes, because it isn't that you just give it to him. He cares for you, so you get something back. And, and, and so the something back is that the Holy Spirit now gives you a new seeing, a new understanding. And in that new understanding, see, it's the same problem. I mean, the person is still there. The event is still there. You, you threw upon him the anxiety. But what does he give back? He gives back you a new seeing. You now see the situation through his eyes, through his mind, through his attitude, inside his wisdom and understanding. We, we don't judge the event, you know. We don't say, well, this is evil. Because once you say it's evil, then you've set up a whole mechanics of rejecting and being afraid of it and threatened by it and all the rest of it. No, we're not talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't see things through that tree. We, we recognize I've given him the anxiety and I recognize now that he is the one in the middle of this situation and his love is bringing about protection, peace. His love is solving and resolving. His love is being my strength and he is being my wisdom. And I live in this, but it is not I, it's Christ. I see things totally different. 
You remember the storm on the lake? And Jesus slept through it. It was the mother of storms. I mean, even Peter, and he'd lived on the lake since he was a kid, but he was terrified. And they, they were all centered on the storm, and they were centered with their imagination on the boat going down. It hadn't gone down, but they, they, saw, they said, we're perishing, we're dying. Jesus slept. Do you remember that? And when they woke him up, he seemed surprised. Do you remember the words? Boy, this is another webinar all in itself. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Ha, huh, I could give him a thousand reasons, but apparently within the new creation, within this place in Christ, there is no fear. Why? Why was Jesus not afraid? Because he was in the hands of his father and the storm was in the hands of his father. And that's the end of it. But for their sake, he turned to the storm and said, peace be still. But apparently for left to himself, he would have slept through the storm. He saw things differently. They all in the same boat, same happenings. They saw two different things. And as you give him your anxiety, you will grow into a seeing of life through him who is the life. Not through whether this thing is good or evil, not whether it brings about all this terror, but simply seeing this is his world, this is his situation. Okay, I, I, I think I've got to come back to this. There's far too much to say that's too good to rush through. But I think I've said enough that you can now see what anxiety is, throw it upon him, that it disappears in the burning of his love and the cross and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit bring in exchange this peace and this wisdom and this handling of life. We'll be back next week and let's develop this. And now the blessing of God who is almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you with the peace of God himself that passes all human comprehension. And may that peace guard you and keep your mind in Christ Jesus so I bless you, and that is the way it is.